asking again Judge Gorsuch who is paying for these ads. It is that simple. The appalling, unacceptable fact is that American justice is being bought. We want to know who's paying. And they bought the ads against Merrick Garland. Now they are buying the ads for Judge Gorsuch, carefully targeted to have maximum political impact. Now, this fact would be appalling enough, but the other facts here are that Judge Gorsuch evaded many of the most pertinent and important questions during this hearing. He did so after the president who nominated him established a litmus test saying that he, his nominee would automatically overturn Roe v. Wade, that he would strike down gun violence measures, that he would be conservative. And he, the president, outsourced his selection process to the Heritage Foundation and to other similar hard right conservative groups that prepared lists for him, screened them, and advised him. So the question is, who is buying these ads? Because it is not only the Judicial Crisis Network and those groups, it is a network of conservative donors who are operating to buy American justice. Let's be clear. President Trump wasn't just consulting these outside groups. He was outsourcing the selection process. And we want to know who is providing the funds that, in effect, are the critical resources to try to shape the outcome here. And if the American people and our colleagues have the sunlight shown on this money network, they'll be better informed about whether Judge Gorsuch should be the next member of the United States Supreme <coughs> Court. We are, I think, united in this effort toward disclosure. And I think there'll be others who will join us in it because it is the right thing to do. I'm hoping maybe our Republican colleagues will show some curiosity in who is spending $17 million on a justice. Unprecedented, historic, appalling. And um, I'm proud to introduce our leader. Well, thank you. And I want to thank Sheldon and Richard. Both have been such leaders on the general issue of sunlight in terms of where all of these, where these millions of dollars and very wealthy special interest people are placing their money. And right here is a case in point. Now let's look at how Judge Gorsuch got to this point. He was recommended for the federal bench by Philip Anschutz, a hard right special interest billionaire. Then he was handpicked for the Supreme Court by the right wing special interest laden Heritage Foundation and Federalist Society. Now millions of dollars in undisclosed special interest donations are being used to prop up his nomination. Americans deserve to know who is funding this effort to get Judge Gorsuch on the highest bench in the land, especially if these secretive funders are pushing his nomination because they believe Judge Gorsuch will vote their way. Judge Gorsuch had a chance to distance himself from these groups when he was asked question after question by my colleagues on the Judiciary Committee and he refused to answer them, raising the suspicion further that he is not a balls and strikes guy, but rather represents the hard right special interest wing of American politics. That's why he's having trouble earning 60 votes. There was a seismic change after his hearing. There were suspicions about Judge Gorsuch when you look at his early writings and who he hung out with 
and particularly that it was on a list that the Heritage Foundation, who most Republicans think is too far to the right, was chosen from that list. He was chosen from that list. But then when he wouldn't answer questions, you say, what is he hiding? These are not difficult questions to answer. He wouldn't even answer, for God's sakes, do you agree with Brown v. Board of Education? He was told by his handlers, don't answer anything, and he did a good job at that. So let me be clear. He was handpicked by special interests, is supported by special interests, and has a record of siding with special interests. This is no neutral, down-the-middle judge, even though he comes off as very erudite and very careful. And if Judge Gorsuch fails to earn 60 votes and fails to demonstrate he is mainstream enough to sit on the highest court, we should change the nominee, not the rules. The Republicans are the ones making the choice to go nuclear. This idea, oh, we have no choice, they're free actors. They could easily come to another nominee who might be a little more mainstream. President Clinton, President Obama consulted Republicans before they nominated someone. President Trump went to the hardest right sector of American politics and said, you give me your wish list and I promise you I'll pick one of those. So, the Republicans should not make a, their choice to go nuclear. They're acting as if a rules change is inevitable like it's the only choice if 60 senators don't agree that Judge Gorsuch should be confirmed, they're wrong. As I said, the answer is not to change the rules, it's to change the nominee. And if the nuclear option is invoked, it's because our Republicans in the Senate chose to do so. I know my friend the majority leader is fond of saying that Judge Gorsuch failing to get 60 votes would be the first partisan filibuster in history. Give me a break. It was Mitch McConnell and the Republicans who didn't even get to the filibuster point with Merrick Garland. He broke 230 years of precedent by instituting a new policy of refusing a president's Supreme Court nominee last year. And that was worse than a filibuster. They wouldn't even get to the filibuster with Justice Garland. And just as the Republicans were free actors, when they didn't give Garland a hearing, no one forced them to do that. They're free actors now. If they decide to change the rules, it'll be on their back. We're going to stay on this subject. Yeah. yeah. I understand the precedent. And you guys chip. Nominee with 60 votes here. You talk about Merrick Garland, though. Why would, if the Republicans were to go to the nuclear option, would that not be interpreted as revenge for what happened in 2013? Or you guys say, well, this is just them doing ex ex extracting revenge. They're saying they're extracting revenge for Okay, because we deliberately, we had the chance, we were free actors in 2013. Like it or not, we changed the rules for lower court judges. There were scores and scores of them held up for months and months and years and years. We made a deliberate decision based on the merits that the Supreme Court is too important to go to a 51 vote uh, situation. We made a decision that you should get 60 votes on such, an important uh, in a, on such an important position so there would be some bipartisanship and some mainstream. And President Trump didn't go to the mainstream. He didn't consult Democrats. He didn't consult anyone but the Heritage Foundation. He didn't even consult mainstream or moderate Republicans. But you no, we left the Supreme Court out of it, well, deliberately. Lower court judges are not the same. It's the co Supreme Court that makes the law the land. So I think on this issue, we showed where we were at, plain and simple. Well, we want to stay on topic I first. Sure. I, well, just, just um, on your topic, um, you guys chip in. Well, well, Judge Gorsuch, we believe, does not belong on the bench. <laughs> and we also believe that there are 
we believe that there are Republicans who are reluctant to change the rules, and we hope they won't do it. They're free actors. And so to assume they're going to change the rules is, is not actually correct. And if they were going to change the rules on this one, why wouldn't they just change them on the next one afterwards anyway? And if I may, very plus, quickly, plus go ahead, let Sheldon. Let chime in on that, because we're dealing with some history here. We're dealing with a history of five to four decisions where all the Republicans on the court posse up and ride out and by six to zero make decisions that help Republicans at the polls, and by 16 to zero make decisions that help corporations against humans. They have a track record of what happens when you let that fifth justice on the court. So this actually is the moment of decision. And if they get five, off they go, perhaps. And the failure of Judge Gorsuch to recognize that this pattern exists, that this pattern is a legitimate cause for concern, and his failure to distance himself from that pattern sent a very strong signal to all of us that he's ready to saddle up and go right back out there for Republicans at the polls and for corporations, even at the expense of our democracy. This is, to me, the critical moment. We'll face later choices, and we'll face them with whatever tools we have at our disposal. But the idea that we'll walk away from this moment and let them rebuild that five to four court when it has proven itself to be so partisan, so predictably partisan, not a fight we can walk away from, not with this judge being so evasive about where he'll fall. Well, and let me just add one more point. There's this myth now that somehow the next one yeah. is the important seat on the court. Every seat on the court is equally important. And Judge Gorsuch's record shows how deeply conservative he is. I've been a law clerk on the Supreme Court. I've argued cases there. There's no such thing as a less important Supreme Court justice. Not only is each of them potentially a swing vote, but each of them can sway others. And Judge Gorsuch has shown himself to be skillful, artful, articulate, and a deeply conservative judge with that bent who can sway his colleagues is as important, certainly, as the next potential appointee, if there is one. We're all saying, or the premise of your question is that there will be another. And one final thing. If they're so quick to change the rules this time, they'll be just as quick to change it next time. We're fighting this judge because of the reasons that Sheldon and uh, Dick outlined. But let me tell you something. If right now already, with this kind of nominee chosen by this kind of group, they're saying, we're going to change the rules, they'll change it again. Let's hope he doesn't. He told you that he will? No. No, no, and we're hoping there are a good number of Republican colleagues who are grumbling at this. They are free actors, the Republicans are. There's nothing that says they have to change the rules if Gorsuch doesn't get 60. And the logic, the irresistible, immutable logic is if the nominee doesn't get 60, you change the nominee, not the rules. What's your argument, what's your argument for Republicans now? Go ahead. I, I'm just confused about the argument is the same argument we used on ourselves. This is too important a position. It should get bipartisan buy-in. A, a nominee for the Supreme Court should not be approved by a razor-thin majority. This is the highest court in the land, a lifetime appointment. Right. The Supreme Court is different. And it should require a consensus of more than 60 votes, a bipartisan consensus, before someone is put on the court. Every now. judge of the last four met a 60-vote bar. Three of them got more than 60 votes, and Alito got more than 60 when there was attempted filibuster. Gorsuch should have to meet the same bar, not change the rules to change it. Hmm? Well, of course. Well, there's no rule now that says they're changing the rules. They could change them any way they want. I, I, and We believe in a 60-vote threshold. That's okay. why we're filing a cloture motion. That's allowed in the rules right now. Right, but it's Last question. 
Okay, I, last I, question. I, I interrupted uh, the, oh, quest, the second question. Go ahead, question. go ahead. Very briefly on another subject, too. Oh, you know, another subject. Uh, oh, well, then you don't get to ask that. The, <laughs> the president looked out in the crowd last night and he said, Hello, Chuck. Are you going to work with him on health care? Well, we, we've sent him a letter today that said, We want to work with you on health care. Make sure that you don't undermine the ACA because you're angry or out of vengeance, because if you undermine our health care system, you're hurting Americans. That's not being a president. That's not leading. And second, we said, um, this idea of repeal has proven not to work. Trump care got about 17 percent popularity in the poll done right before it passed. So <laughs> once they get off this kick of repeal and stop undermining the health care system, we have suggestions we want to make to make the system better. They'll have suggestions. We should get in a room and try to make the system better. We're happy to do that. May I okay. Go you. ahead, please. Add one yeah. thing to that. Just by way of example to prove that this actually can work, if there's an issue that's nearly as divisive as health care, it's education. The HELP Committee recently rewrote the entire secondary education law the Every Student Succeeds Act. It wasn't a little change in law. It was a big change in law. It came out of the HELP Committee unanimously, unanimously. If the President wants to get something done, he ought to charge the Senate committees to use the regular process of governance to have hearings, to hear witnesses, to consider amendments, and to work together in bipartisan fashion to get something done. It has been done very recently. It can be done again, but it doesn't work when you go to the far-right special interest groups, grab crazy things off the shelves, and try to jam those crazy things through the Congress, which, by the way, looks a lot like what they've done with Judge Gorsuch. Go on to the right-wing interest groups, grab somebody off the shelf, and try to jam them through without proper consultation or awareness of yeah. what the concerns are. Just to reiterate what Sheldon said, you can't govern from the hard right. President Trump campaigned against both the Democratic and Republican establishments. But when he came into office, he chose his appointments, including Supreme Court, and governed from the hard right. Even without Democrats, he's having trouble doing that, as Trump care shows. He'll have trouble constantly unless he moves to the middle. We're waiting for him to do it. Thank you all. Thank you. Thanks.